Good evening. How are we doing? Welcome to free GMAT prep hour. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, thanks for joining me, whether you are watching live or watching on the recording. Thanks for being here. Uh, I am chatting with some people. Feel free to hit me up. I'll do my best to monitor that. And I'm hoping today is somewhat of an interactive hour. I've got something a little bit different planned. Uh, and you know what? Why don't we just get to it? Um, how often have you all thought while doing GMAT problems, wow, if I just had a little more time, I'd be able to do this? If you're anything like a lot of the students I work with, probably quite a lot. Right, because the GMAT is very time pressured and the adaptive nature of the test is such that it's always going to challenge us. You probably bump up against the clock on lots of questions uh, once you've kind of found that right level of difficulty for you. Um, but the good news is if you're being truthful when you say, if I just had a bit more time, I could solve this, means you've probably found a decent solution pathway. You've just found it maybe a little too late in the game. And so uh, the key is gonna be to find that fruitful solution pathway a little faster, a little more efficiently. And that's what I hope to talk to you about a little bit more today. Um, how to give your best, how to give yourself the best chance at getting started uh, on a GMAT problem. So I don't know if any of you have checked out the Manhattan Prep blog, but there's lots of cool posts there. Um, you know, they're not, they're not videos, but they're like free GMAT prep minute or 10 minute or something like that, but good articles on a variety of topics. You can search the history there. Um, there's an older article on there um, that's written by one of our most veteran GMAT instructors, Stacy. And if you read the blog, you probably come across a number of her articles. Um, but there's one that's called the distinction between a, se a 700 and a 760 score on the GMAT. And, you know, there are some really interesting things there. Um, not surprisingly is that, you know, one of the things that leads to these scores or differentiates the two is um, the higher your goal score, the higher level of mastery you'll need in a handful of areas. And I wanna talk about one of those areas today. So those areas aren't just content focused, right? Um, you need to develop a certain mastery wherever you're shooting uh, on, the, on the score line, 600, 650, 700, 750, et cetera. Um, you need to achieve certain levels of mastery in a bunch of areas. Probably most important is time management, right? Because you know you might be asked like two exponent questions on the GMAT, but you're gonna have to manage your time uh, across 67 of these things in quantum verbal. And I'm talking with someone in chat about uh, getting better at time management too. Um, so time management's a big one, but also endurance, right? Operating at peak performance across you know, multiple hours of testing. Uh, maintaining focus across that testing as well. Um, learning good guessing strategies, depending on the format, depending on the content areas. Uh, of course, content as well. Um, but one of the things that Stacy talks about in this article is a mastery of recognition. And that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, problem recognition, so to speak. So in the article, um, Stacy kind of defines a little bit what it means to recognize, and I've, I've cut some of the, uh, the excerpts out and put them here. So we just take a look at these, right? Recognizing means that like when you see a new question, you can make some connection pretty quickly to a problem in your GMAT history, right? Something you've already done. There's some link between these two problems or maybe between the problem on the screen and like a family of problems you've done before uh, and you recognize that connection. And because of that connection, now you have an in on this new problem. Like, yes, it is technically a problem you've never seen, but you've seen it's kind of DNA in other problems like it, right? You might be aware of common mistakes you've made on problems like this before, and now that kind of tips you off to be careful as you maneuver through this problem, looking out for those mistakes you've made in the past, 
right? But the key is you, you have this kind of solving memory. It's like muscle memory, but it's like brain memory, recognition. Um, and you are able to attack this problem as if it's not just brand new, but uh, a version of something you've done in the past successfully. And then if you don't recognize what to do on a problem, you kind of have to start from scratch. And I think a lot of people who struggle on the GMAT feel like they're starting from scratch um, on problem after problem after problem. And, and that builds, right? Um, that's really draining. Uh, it doesn't build confidence. Um, and you can kind of spiral uh, downwards pretty quickly. So a lot of these things are taken from Stacy's article. Um, she then goes on to talk about kind of the recognition rates of like what a 700 level score will recognize, how often and how quickly. And, you know, she says, you know, on just under half of the problems, a 700 level score will recognize kind of how to attack this, these problems in about 20 or 30 seconds. And, you know, as you, know, you score higher and higher, um, you'll recognize what to do on more problems in less time. And I think this correlation is really, really strong. Okay, as you get better and better at, at the GMAT, it's likely because um, you're recognizing what to do more and more often uh, in less amounts of time. So those first like 20, 30 seconds of a problem are really critical. Right, but it's often those first 20 or 30 seconds when people freeze up right, and they kind of look lost uh, on a new problem. It's, it's not like sports, right, where clutchness is measured in the fourth quarter, right? Who's going to show up in the fourth quarter of this game? Um, I think on the GMAT problems, it's often the first quarter of each problem uh, where these problems are won and lost. And so I know it's, it's dangerous to assume things when it comes to the GMAT. Um, but here we go anyway. I'm going to assume y'all are watching or you're here because uh, you're looking to increase your GMAT score. And I think one way to do it is to get better at boosting this uh, recognition percentage and speed. So how do you improve this stuff? Well, for one, I think you need to build a solid base of past questions. And, you know, so we can make these connections with new problems to the old ones. And that doesn't mean I just want you going through hundreds and hundreds of, of questions. Uh, you need to go through questions thoroughly and try to extract as much as possible um, from these questions as you can. I, I, got, a, I got a hand raised in, in, uh, in chat. Go ahead and just type in your question to me. Um, just pull open chat. There should be a, an option that says more. Um, just go ahead and, and type in your question for me. I'll see if I can circle around to it. Thanks, Robert. I think it was Robert, maybe it was someone else. Can't remember. All right, so we're gonna to wanna to build uh, a base of question familiarity, and this is why it's really important not just to slug through lots and lots of problems, but to review them thoroughly, right? What is What are all the clues in a certain problem, right? What are all the ways that you might be able to attack this problem that maybe you didn't notice the first time through? Uh, what are the common types of traps on this problem? right? Uh, take a look at some wrong answers. How would uh, a student end up on a wrong answer if they make one little mistake? All right, so those are some things to think about on any problem that you do. Um, building lists of best practices by topic. Yeah, so if you recognize that a certain problem has to do with topic A, um, you'll want to kind of have a, an index of good things, good techniques, good formulas that you associate with that certain topic, okay? So maybe we can build on some of that today. I'm gonna to show you some problems and if you're not really sure uh, what, top, what strategies and um, ways to approach a certain content area are, I'll try to throw some at you, all right? But you can build lists, you know, you can take a look at all the Manhattan Prep strategy guides and for every single chapter in there, uh, try to build a list of the best things you wanna do on exponent problems, on quadratics, on overlapping sets, on triangles and diagonals and things like that. And also verbal. And then the third piece is gonna be able to practice this, right? We've gotta kind of situate ourselves in the newness of problems and, uh, and try giving this recognition stuff a shot. So that's what we're gonna to do today, wow.
and, and we'll see we'll see how it works out. Um, here's what I want to do. I want you to, if you're watching live or you're watching online, um, take out your phone. I want you to take out your phone. And um, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to recognize a bunch of stuff in this problem I'm going to put on the screen. It's a problem you've never seen before because I made it up. And I want you to record yourself like saying things out loud that you recognize. And then after 30 seconds go by, you're going to get to listen to your thought process, right? You're going to listen to the recording of yourself, and we're going to see how accurate you were, how successful you were, um, where there's room for improvement. So you all have your phones, right? I'm going to get my phone out too uh, so I can time you. And if, and if I don't know, if you have an iPhone, I found the, the voice recorder just under um, utilities voice memos, but you can always just record your record the video and it'll capture the audio too. So get your phone out. Um, we are going to give you 30 seconds to practice recognizing everything you can in this following problem. All right, here you go. 30 seconds. Go for it. All right, go ahead and stop it right there. Don't delete it. Don't delete it. Um, I want you to play back your recording so you can hear what you're noticing in real time. Um, and go ahead and type it into the chat box. You can send it to just me personally, and you can send it to the whole group if you want. Um, but go ahead and listen to your recording and type out into chat uh, all the stuff that you noticed. Ooh, okay, I'm getting some stuff already. And if you're watching this on the recording, like actually do this. I think this would be worthwhile. So you can just rewind it and, and go take a look at that problem for 30 seconds and really try recognizing here. And we'll see how well you do if you are missing anything. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like this. There's some good uh, things coming through. There's also some very kind of honest uh, responses, right? I, I kind of just read and finished the problem. Some people just finished it. So if you're finishing a problem like this in 30 seconds, you're obviously recognizing some good stuff. Um, yeah. So what I see a lot of, I see a lot of people recognizing kind of content areas. Um, but let me kind of show you what what I might recognize uh, in this problem. So I'm going to I'm going to give myself 30 seconds as well. Um, okay, it's like a wordier problem, it's problem solving. So there's going to be some translating here that I need to get done. Uh, the answer choices are actual numbers. Maybe I could work backwards. What's the mean of this? Yep, so the question's asking for a specific value of one of the numbers in the set. I'm dealing with 10 consecutive integers. That suggests certain things to me based on the relationship of all the terms. Uh, sum of four mean. Oh, I know the mean of consecutive integers is the median, and maybe I'll write out a system of dashes to organize my work. So um, I had a, a kind of a bunch of that stuff coming in in chat, uh, but some other things you wanna look at in, instead of just content would be like strategies, right? Like what the answer choices afford you. So, you know, there's a lot happening here. It's okay if you aren't moving that quickly. After all, like I made this problem up, so I have a huge advantage. Um, but the goal is really to extract as much as possible um, from every problem you see, whether it's new or it's old. So this is what we call uh, like the understanding and planning phases of the solving process, right? Don't worry about solving just yet in these first 30 seconds, right? Because if, if you start solving without understanding what's going on and without having a good plan, uh, you might just be 
wasting time or digging, digging yourself in a hole if you have the wrong approach. So I'm considering format, problem solving versus data sufficiency. I'm considering the answer choices because it's a problem solving question. What do the answer choices afford me? Like, could I pick numbers for this? Could I work backwards? Could I estimate? Things like that. I'm looking at content area, consecutive integers and sums and averages are like a really big topic and consecutive integers suggest certain things to me. Um, there are properties related to the sums of consecutive integers and the products of consecutive integers. So if you don't know what those are, um, you might start creating a list. Uh, don't have to deal with products here because it's talking about sums. Um, I know that whenever I'm dealing with consecutive integers or evenly spaced numbers in general, the, the mean and the median will always be the same. And I know that when I deal with a set, like a finite number of terms, like or a small finite number, like 10 or fewer, um, I'm going to create a system of organization to kind of keep track here. So let's go ahead and walk through this one. Um, I, will, I will give you some more opportunities to uh, recognize other problems moving forward. But let's go ahead and, uh, and move through this one. Um, let's do the, uh, let's see, we'll do the working backwards approach first, and then we'll do the algebra, okay? So what I know from the problem is the sum of these is 294. And I'm looking for the average of these or the mean of these. Right. Now, one connection you could make here is that the mean is equal to the median. All right, and if you don't know that for consecutive integers, it's a good one to have right now. So write it down. Remember that forever. Or until you're done with the GMAT. All right, so I'm not actually looking for the average or the mean. I'm really just looking for the median. And the nice thing about that is the median is this term. So it's actually a number in the set. So right now, uh, I know I could get rid of a couple answers, right? It's got to be a number in the set, and the set is con uh, consists of all integers, so C and E would go out. And at this point, I could just try plugging in one of the remaining answers. I'll just go ahead with B, because it's right in the middle. If this is 68, if that is indeed the answer, then I could say, oh, this will be 69, 70, 71, 72. 73, 74, 75, and I'll check to see if that sum equals 294. You just add these up real quick. I'm sure some of you have faster ways of doing it, but we'll just do it the old fashioned way. Two plus three is five, plus four is nine, plus five is 14. I've got four sevens here, so that should add up to 28, plus another one. That should be 29, so 294, bingo. And that means 68 is the answer, okay? So there's one way to do it. I will say a huge uh, help in this problem is having the system of dashes. So that might be another takeaway or another good approach if you uh, did not do something like that, okay? Uh, I also want to be able to do it kind of the textbook way because uh, I want to be as versatile a problem solver as possible. So this is supposed to sum to 294. And I've got some like pretty good, uh, pretty good suggestions in chat over here already. Yeah, again, I'm looking for uh, the average here. So there's a handful of ways you could do this. I don't know any of the terms here, but what's really important is I know how they all relate. Yeah, um, I've got some good ideas. It's kind of arbitrary where you pick your first variable, but if I just chose any of these numbers, if I chose this as X, then this would be X minus uh, one, right? And this would be X minus two. So I could just choose this first one as X, X plus one, X plus two, X plus three, and say, hey, all of these add up to 294. 
I could solve for x, right? So if I add all those up, there's four x's there. One, two, and three add up to six. So 4x is 288. 288 is a pretty good number, by the way. Right, like 288 is a good number uh, in that it's, it's pretty common. It's like way more common than 287. 288 is 16 times 18. Um, so 4x is 288, that means a single x will be 72. And 288 is like a more, more common number than 287 because you can divide 288 in lots of different ways. So 4 times 72 is 288. So I would know that this is 72, and then I would be able to go figure out the rest of these, and you can kind of take it from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had another suggestion in chat. Uh, we could just actually call, we could have called this x, right? And then this would be x plus 1, x plus 2, etc. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then you'd have 4x plus, I guess that would be 30, equals 294. And you could solve for x that way. That would be this number. You got to be careful. That would be 66. Okay. Uh, and we're looking for this one, which would be 68. Um, maybe the easiest way would be to set this as x. And then say this is x plus 4, x plus 5, x plus 6, and x plus 7. Um, something like that. But remember, with consecutive integers, you don't really have 10 unknowns, right? It, it, you might think you have 10 unknowns, and that can seem really daunting. You actually have one unknown, right? Because these are all related uh, to each other by uh, the next integer. Cool. Yeah, there's, uh, there's some good stuff here. Uh, lots of really good suggestions. I've had like very, very good suggestions, and I can't get to them all. I cannot get to them all. But one other thing you could do is take a look at how these answers have been constructed, right? Like, I know 68 is the right answer, or 68 is the right answer. Um, what do the other numbers represent, right? Like, push yourself. What is 70.5, and how would someone end up picking it on this problem? Any ideas? I mean, we straight up eliminated it. Because it's, uh, because it's not one of the integers, right? We said we're looking for this value. Yeah, it's the mean or the median of the entire set, right? So if you just were going too fast and figured out the mean of the entire set, you'd pick C. Yeah. What about answer E? How would someone end up at answer E? Yeah, answer E is actually the average of the last four terms or the mean or the median of the last four terms. So if you are moving too fast and forget what you're actually taking the mean of, you pick that. Yeah, I mean the last four. Um, 66 is not the mean of the smallest five integers, it's the smallest integer. And then 72 uh, would have been this number if you, you know, start, started with x, x plus 1, x plus 2 x plus 3, and then just solve for x, you pick d. So you want to watch out for uh, how you might end up at wrong answers in problem solving. That's a great way to push your problem solving uh, ability a little bit further, right? Don't just settle for what the right answer is, but start looking at um, how someone would end up at the wrong answer. Cool. All right. So we, I think we, we put that problem uh, to rest here. Um, I'd like to do this a little bit more, all right? And so to get us some more experience here. I don't wanna just do one question at a time, right? I wanna simulate kind of the onslaught of newness, of newness, that is the GMAT. So I'm gonna do four questions in a row and they'll be up on the screen for 30 seconds each um, with no breaks, right? They're gonna be one after another. And I want you to get your phone back out and record yourself, all right? So we're gonna go for two minutes here. Um, yeah, you'll have, this is a great kind of thing you can practice on your own too, right? You get to, you get to hear yourself play, uh, hear yourself think. This was, I, I was a performing musician in college and this was like the worst part about uh, practicing was recording yourself and listening to yourself later. And it's pretty humbling, but I have to say it, it lights a fire under you. It makes you better. Um, a little painful during the process, but you're thankful for it afterwards. All right, so uh, get your phone out, get ready to record yourself. I'll get the timer going. And we'll get 30 seconds for uh, four problems in a row here. No breaks, record what you recognize, and go for it.
All right, new question. Thirty seconds go by fast. All right, last one. All right. Ooh, that was two minutes. That was good. That's a lot. Yeah. Take a deep breath. Um, cause I know you're, you're probably going at a hundred miles an hour there. Um, don't delete that. All right. Hold on to the recording. We're going to listen to it later. Uh, now some of you might be asking, Hey, what's going on? Those, those were all problem solving questions. What are the data sufficiency questions? And you're right. I didn't have any data sufficiency questions there. I'm avoiding those today because I found that in these events, um, sometimes there's just kind of different levels of familiarity with data sufficiency and that can get a little bit uh, tough to untangle. Um, however, uh, should you practice this, and you should, um, on data sufficiency questions later, um, here are some of the things that I'll be kind of looking out for when it comes to this format. So obviously I'm looking at the content areas and I know you all will be thinking about that as well. Uh, but in addition to just the content, I don't know, what else do you think I should be looking for in data sufficiency? Hit me up in chat. What are some other things you wanna keep in mind on data sufficiency questions? Oh, look at you guys. This is awesome. Yeah, look at different strategies, restrictions, the C trap, value or yes, no, integers, yeah, okay. Um, positives and negatives, so properties. This is good stuff. And um, I think you are actually, oh, can you simplify? All right, you guys, are, you guys are good. Now, are you actually doing this when a new problem hits the screen? So some things I'm, uh, I'm thinking of here uh, are what, what, what type of question is this? Like besides data sufficiency, is it a yes, no question or is it a value question? And then you can kind of build on top of that. Like if it's a value question, is it the value for like a single unknown object or unknown variable? Or is it like a combo question? Is it like, what's the value of 2x minus 3y? Because those are a little bit different than what's the value of x. All right, so single unknown or combination of unknowns. Um, yeah, can I rephrase the question or the statements, right? A lot of times the difficulty in data sufficiency questions is um, the GMAT just kind of disguises what they're asking you and shrouds it in more complicated uh, phrasing and terminology. Same thing with the statements. Sometimes the statements are giving you very simple information, uh, but they're presented in a very uh, confusing way. Yeah, are there initial conditions uh, or constraints on the problem? Um, does it tell me up front, like in the question stem, like if X is positive, is x a one digit integer you know something like that well now that you know it's positive that puts some uh constraints on what x can be and sometimes like there's enough of initial of an initial condition that like really limits down the possibilities of what the unknown can be like if x is a prime number less than 25 and so Right then and there, I'm thinking, well, there's only nine numbers, nine values that are possible for X before I even get to my statements one and two. All right, so checking initial conditions or constraints is, is really important. 
Uh, maybe thinking about which statement looks easier, right? Tackle the easier statement first, right? The GMAT is difficult. Don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. Try the easy stuff first. Um, see if there's any overlap between the statements, or maybe the statements are exactly the same. If the statements are exactly the same, the answer is either D or E. Um, if one statement completely subsumes the other one, or like is more specific than the other one, that limits some answer choices. Uh, would there be good guessing strategies or traps to avoid? So I like that y'all were talking about uh, the C trap and to watch out for that. It's good stuff. Cool. So let's go ahead and look at these. Um, go ahead and play back the first 30 seconds of your recording on this problem and type in what you notice. I got an entire, I got an entire paragraph. Oh, okay. Robert put down everything for all of the statements. It's good stuff to so come back through there and check. <clears throat> yeah. So, okay. Percentage problem. I might want the, the profit or percent change formula. That seems like a good idea. Um, ooh, I like this one suggestion by Robert that says use fractions, not percentages. That's cool because it says percent of, which means we're multiplying. It's always easier to multiply fractions than percents. I know technically 25% is a fraction, but you know what I mean? Make it a quarter. That's good stuff. Um, yeah, profit and loss order. Answer splits. Ooh, okay, so I like this. I like that someone's looking at the answers here. Um, and we're not solely looking at the question. Remember, the answers are part of the problem, or answers are part of the question. If you're not looking at the answer choices, I'd say you're not being as resourceful as you can be. And, and on the GMAT, you need to be as resourceful as possible. And so one thing I'm noticing in the answer choices is there's some answer pairing, right? Like, I know a $1,000 profit is the opposite of a $1,000 loss. Right, and same things with answers B and D. Which means like, I have to be really careful about the direction that I compute these changes in, right? Because if I go the wrong way, I'll end up at the mirror answer choice. So that's something I wanna be aware of here, okay? Yeah, some other things I notice in this problem are, uh, it's, a, it's like a value question in a sense, but it's, the total profit for the two transactions combined, or the total loss for the two transactions combined, which means I'm not going to be able to work backwards here, because suppose the right answer were B, like if there were a $2,000 profit total, there's lots of combinations of two transactions that will sum to a $2,000 profit. So even though the answer choices look somewhat nice, I actually can't work backwards. Um, there's some other stuff in here that I think is worth recognizing. Um, I've got two cars, and so maybe I'll want to like have some workspace for each of them. And I know the dealer sold each car for 20,000, so that's kind of like the end, right? So there's like two phases for each of these cars. There's like the purchase, and then there's the sell right? The selling phase for both cars. So maybe I'd like to organize that, right? Whenever there's kind of multiple points in a timeline, uh, that can help me with the way I organize. Cool. Um, now I'll go ahead and, and just kind of solve this, I think, now that I've got some, some stuff in mind. Uh, I'm going to change the percents to fractions based on someone's recommendation. So it's a quarter and a fifth. And so uh, I can kind of show that a couple ways in here. I'm selling each car for 20,000. So I'll go ahead and jot that in. And I know car one, uh, ooh, there's like, like a profit. Yay. <laughs> 
Good job, car dealer. Um, we, we've got an increase of 25% here, or an increase of a quarter to get to 20,000. All right, and I've got a decrease, oh, bad job, car dealer. Um, a decrease of 20% here, so you've lost a fifth of the value here. Okay, so then I could probably write out some equations here. Um, I'm starting at X. I'm adding a quarter of the value or increasing by 25% to get to 20,000. Uh, I like the suggestions in here. You're gonna change to fractions. So that means you are increasing by a quarter. Don't just multiply by a quarter, multiply by five fourths, right? Five fourths to get to 20,000. You can solve for X here. That's equal to 20,000 times four fifths. 20,000 divided by five is 4,000. So this will be 4,000 times four. So the first car was purchased for 16,000. You sold it for 2,000, it's a profit of 4,000 bucks. All right, I'm gonna do the same thing over here. I'll just do it with Y, all right? I start with some unknown here, but then I lose 20%, I lose a fifth. Now I like to think of losing percentages or losing fractions as what still remains, because I'm an optimist, right? You'll do better next month, car dealer. All right, so instead of multiplying by a fifth and subtracting that from where you started, I will multiply by four fifths, right? Because that's a loss of a fifth. That's equal to 20,000. So isolate Y, 20,000 times five fourths would be Y. 20,000 divided by four is 5,000. So 5,000 times five would mean Y is 25,000. So here's the deal. You bought both cars for 16 and 25, so purchase total is 41,000, and selling total is, well, you each sold them, you sold them each for 20,000, 40,000 bucks. Uh, better luck next month, right? You sell for $1,000 less than you bought, and so you've got a $1,000 loss. Um, yeah, so you gotta watch out for answer A here especially, because answer A will be if you thought the purchase prices were 20,000 bucks, and you uh, modeled off of that, okay? Yeah, I had a lot of, lot of good info coming into the chat box here. That was really good stuff. Um, if you didn't recognize some of this, you did that, good stuff. Uh, that's, oh, you did, you got the wrong answer, oh no. All right, so probably moving too quickly, right? Um, Gui, this is one of those problems maybe we were talking about earlier where, um, you might be flying through what questions you think maybe are easier because you're spending longer on harder questions. So gotta make sure we clean up the mistakes on easier questions before we uh, spend too long on harder questions. Yeah, like if your goal is a, a 700 on the GMAT, like you can miss like lots of 750 level questions. That's okay, you're not trying to prove that you need a 750. Um, but if your goal score is a 700, uh, you can't be missing 600 level questions often, right? And that might be what this is. Cool. On to the next one. Uh, listen to the next 30 seconds of your recording and uh, tell me what you wrote down for this one or you said out loud for this one. Yeah, see, I know I already had some people tell me. All right. Yeah, looks good. Oh, I have some people talking to, talking to me in the Q&A. Yeah, so the, um, I would, it's totally okay, I can check that. I would just go ahead and use the chat box, the chat room, if you if you have it. All right, uh, right triangle inside a circle. Interesting that you say right triangle. Um, geometry problem solving, triangle inscribed in a circle, diameter equals the base, base and height can be found. Okay, so there's some good stuff here. Um, we're looking for, you know, the area of this triangular region. So some people are throwing out um, the equation for area of a triangle. There was one other thing back here. Yeah, calculate 
to the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, a lot of good stuff here. Um, let me let me talk to you about some other processes that I would want to keep in mind on a problem like this because uh, I think one thing that I want to push people away from and towards now is not being in a hurry to solve right away, but being uh, very deliberate about what kind of steps you take early on in the process. So that's going to be looking at the answers. All right, it's going to be you know on a geometry problem like this. Like redraw this. Tell yourself that you're going to redraw this problem, right? So in this problem, I see that it's some multiple shape picture. So I'm going to redraw it, and you know maybe yours is prettier than that. That's okay. I'm going to redraw it. Yeah, spend time on front end work. That's what I'm interested here. And in. yeah, spend time on the uh, the front end work. Uh, Robert, just go ahead and ask your question in uh, in the chat room if you have it. All right, so I'm redrawing this for sure. Um, you don't actually have to redraw it in those 30 seconds, but make sure you tell yourself that you're going to. Um, something else I notice is that there's an interaction between two shapes, and when two shapes interact like this, when there's in when one's inscribed in the other, when they share components, uh, that's going to be really critical. So what I see here is that the one leg of a triangle is shared by the diameter of the circle. So that's going to be really important. Um, I also want to look at the answers. These answers might look like really ugly to you, but the ugliness of these answers actually are really helpful because square root of two and square root of three are really significant in geometry, right? Square root of two is used for 45, 45, 90 triangles, and square root of three is used for 30, 60, 90 triangles. Like when you see these numbers, you're on notice for those special right triangles. Okay, so that would pop into my head from looking at the answers. Um, yeah, so someone said, this is a right triangle. Yes, you should know this is a right triangle because uh, the side of the triangle inscribed, one of the sides is the diameter, and that is a rule. So sometimes with geometry, you just have to know your rules, unfortunately. Uh, if you don't know that rule, write it down. Yeah, really, it works like this. Um, I'll just show the, the general version. I'm going to draw a prettier, prettier circle here. Um, it works like this in general. If you have a central angle, that central angle opens up an arc length, okay? And if you have an, ex, uh, an exterior angle or an angle from the outside of the circle that opens up the same arc length, it will be half the measurement. So if this were x degrees, this would be 2x degrees. And you can prove that with by drawing another radius and drawing some isosceles triangles. But this is just a, a specific version of that because this line is worth 180 degrees and it opens up an arc of half the circle and so does this. So this has to be half, which is 90 degrees. Cool. So again, if you are, if this is new to you, new facts, go ahead and jot them down. These are, these are good ones to know. All right, so on my new picture, I know that this is one, and someone said that, oh yeah, this is two, right? Because if the radius is one, uh, the diameter is two. And now you have uh, your clues that this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle, right? You can use the Pythagorean theorem, or you might just recognize that the hypotenuse is double one of the legs, and that will only happen in a 30, 60, 90 triangle, so this one must be the square root of three. All right, if you don't know that side ratio for 30, 60, 90 triangles, uh, let me know, and I will come back around to it at the end of the, at the, end of the hour. All right. So now you can use your uh, area of a triangle rule. It's one half base times the height. Um, I don't want to take this as the base and this as the height. Instead, I'm just going to flip this triangle around. I'm going to rotate it. Uh, I guess I'm going to rotate it. What would that be? quite a bit, maybe 120 degrees. I'm trying to eyeball that. I'll rotate it like this, so now the triangle looks like that. This is one, this is two, this is root three. One half base times height, one half one times root three is square root of three over two. And you could have probably gotten that a handful of different ways, right? You know this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle, not a 45, 45, 91, because that would look different. Uh, and then you could probably estimate that the answer can't be C, D, or E, right? If this is one, 
and this is two, then you would know that this is less than two. And if you took the area of that, one half times one times something less than two, that would give you something less than one. So it couldn't be C, D, or E. So when it comes to geometry problems like this, you can often estimate as well. So answer B. Yeah, I'll try to uh, come back around to the special right triangles uh, a little bit later, towards the end. All right, you guys are killing it. I'm having fun with this. I hope, I hope you guys are too. Uh, definitely something different. All right, on to the next one. Let's see, uh, this one. Go ahead and uh, listen to the next 30 seconds of your recording and tell me what you notice. Tell me what you noticed. Actually, that would be right. What did you notice 15 minutes ago? Mm, I like it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So content wise, this is looking pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Victor, if you've got a, a question, go ahead and just write it into the uh, write it into the chat box. <laughs> I've seen lots of people raise their hands. This is cool. All right, so yeah, we've got ratios and we also have um, specific numbers, right? So ratios by themselves don't necessarily imply specific values. Um, they can imply kind of families of specific values, but not one particular value. But then when you have like the fact that K gave Alberto specifically 10 stamps, um, now you have ingredients to use the unknown multiplier. Yes, and I've got a handful of people. Uh, no problem, Victor. I have a handful of people uh, sending that in. Yeah, I mean, also the answer choices look pretty nice. Um, I think you could probably work backwards here, but it's not as easy as it might seem because, again, it's kind of a, uh, it's a combo problem, right? It's the difference between K and Alberto at the end. Yeah, so it'll be a little trickier to work backwards, but it is doable using this ratio. It is doable. I would challenge you to uh, try working backwards using this ratio at the end. Yeah, you guys are you guys are doing really well. I, I will say just before we kind of get uh, get to solving this, another thing that I would notice about this problem is that again we've kind of got like two scenarios happening here. So remember, um, we had the cars being purchased and sold. And then like there was there were those for each of the cars, uh, each of the two cars. In this case, like I've got um, before the tr gift of the 10 stamps and I've got like after the gift. So I like to keep track of the two kind of parts in the timeline uh, when I'm doing my work. And then I, I have some information about K and, and I have some information about uh, Alberto. And I might kind of use this to help organize. So I think organization is often um, really, really important here. Okay, so now let's go ahead and start kind of jotting down uh, what we know. I'm gonna use this, this unknown multiplier uh, to help. And again, the, the signs for the unknown multiplier is when you have ratios and kind of specific numbers, uh, right? Like, was a ratio of five to three stamps. Like I don't know if it's really five and three or 10 and six or 500 and 300, right? There's an infinite number of combinations that can exist in a five to three ratio. Um, but then when I get that there's a specific change of 10, 10 stamps, that's gonna be uh, the sign that I wanna use this unknown multiplier. So the, if you're not familiar with the unknown multiplier, let me just kind of sketch it out. Um, before the gift, like uh, K could have five and Alberto could have three or K could have 10, Alberto could have six, or it could be like 50 and 30, or it could be, um, I don't know, 80 and 48, right? There's lots and lots of combinations. Um, but what I know is however many Kate had, Alberto had three fifths as much. And so maybe like the best way to write that out is like, I don't know 
how many stamps K had initially, but she had some multiple of five. And I don't know what that multiple is. It's the unknown multiple. Uh, and so I'll call it 5x. And I know Alberta would have the corresponding multiple of three. Right? And you can see those are still in a five to three ratio. And so then we know after the gift, well, if K started with 5x stamps, now she has 10 fewer than that. And those 10 stamps didn't just evaporate, they went to Al. And so we're going to give Al those 10 stamps. I don't know how many he started with. I called it 3x. So now I'll just write in terms of 3x, he's got 10 more. But this is the key. Now I know that this ratio, and ratios are fractions, is equivalent to 7 to 5. And 7 to 5 can also be written as a fraction. And now you can cross multiply and solve for x. So go ahead and try that if you have it. Try to beat me through this. What would the cross multiplication look like? Almost lost that one there. Subtract 21x from both sides and add 50 to both sides. Yeah, x is 30. Now you gotta watch out here, because wow, 30, 30 is staring me in the face. Yeah, this is this, you're not done yet. And I just had someone uh, mention that, like, I think the issue with this is the how many more stamps, right? So this is a, a kind of a, a step in the solution process that I think a lot of people will get to and think they're done. Uh, but it's not, right? It's not what is x. Now you want to plug x in and see how many more stamps Alberto had, or K had than Alberto. Now you gotta be really careful here, all right? There's actually a really important modifier here, right? It's like, as a result of this gift. So it's after the gift that we wanna look at, right? After K gives 10 stamps to Alberto. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug 30 in to here. All right, so 5 times 30 is 150, minus 10 is 140, 3 times 30 is 90, plus 10 is 100. So K has 140, Alberto has 100, and that's a difference of 40 stamps, and that's actually going to be our answer. Yeah, pretty tricky. Pretty tricky here, um, because you can see how someone would pick 30, and if you plug 30 into the starting number of stamps, this would be 150 and this would be 90, and that would be a difference of 60 stamps. Tricky. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's go to the last one. All right, listen to your recording for this one. Tell me what you recognize. Ooh, the plug-in method. Oh, man. Uh-oh, I'm getting a lot of, uh, I'm, get <laughs> I'm getting a lot of nothing in chat. I don't know, that might be telling. Ooh. Okay, so one thing you could say about this problem is it looks difficult, right? That might be, that's an important thing to recognize on some problems. Um, if the first 30 seconds go by and you're like, I really don't know how I would go about solving this, that might mean you recognize it's a skip problem. Okay, I do not think this is an easy problem. I um, mean, you kind of have to know some important rules to proceed with conviction. Uh, it's also like the format of this problem kind of sucks, right? Because you've got like the Roman numerals and then the answer choices based off of them. So kind of the multiple tiers of uh, 
multiple choice is, is an issue. So I think this would be a, a perfect kind of like skip problem. But we're not going to skip it. All right, we're actually going to do it. So some of the things that I'm noticing in this problem are that uh, I see this terminology must be an integer. Who must be, not just could be, but must be means there's like rules in place, right? Um, and combined with the word integer, right, positive integers, this seems like a number property issue. Um, other things I might notice is that like, hey, all of the Roman numerals have these like tiny primes in them, right? You might want to recognize uh, when you see little prime numbers because that implies a lot of divisibility issues, okay? Um, it says n is an integer and then it's talking about n cubed. So what what do perfect cubes and divisibility, like what's the connection there, right? How do perfect cubes kind of relate to divisibility? Yeah, so I mean, if you're drawing a blank on this, um, this is a totally fine question to skip. Again, like you don't have to get all the hard questions right to do well on the GMAT. You just have to like leave yourself enough time and energy to do the questions that you should get right. right? You don't have to, um, uh, what do they call it? Outkick your coverage on this. I don't know. That might not be the right term. All right. So n cube perfect cubes have kind of specific uh, properties, right? So when you take a number like 27, which I know is a perfect cube, I know that this factors all the way down into a bunch of threes. Okay. And if I take the number uh, 125, you would see at the bottom of its tree, uh, three fives. Now let's take a, a more complicated perfect cube. Let's take 216, because it's not just the, um, the cube of a prime number, right? This number is six cubed. And so at the bottom of its prime tree are a trio of twos and a trio of threes. Yes, you have like triplets of each prime factor. And that should make sense because what one way you could have broken 216 is to just break it into its cube root, right? And each six is made up of a two and a three. So a two and a three. All right, and so that's gonna be uh, what must be at the bottom of every perfect cube. You have to have triplets of uh, each prime factor. So let's clean this up a little bit and take a look at 450. Or we could just take a look at 450y. Uh, question, how do I know that plug and play um, would not work? Um, I guess like if you chose one of these, uh, you still don't know what y is, right? I know y divided by nine times two times five, so y divided by 90 is an integer, and that just tells me y is divisible by 90, and so y is a multiple of 90, but then I don't know like which multiple of 90 it is. Um, there probably are multiples of 90 such that I could make this n cubed, but they're probably ones, I don't know if every single one will work. So there's just too much uncertainty over what y can be here, I think. I mean, maybe it would work. I just have a hard time seeing it because it's what must be true, not what could be true. Um, yeah, you'd have to find, find one that like isn't true for each of these, right? Because if it's not true for one particular value of y that satisfies a Roman numeral, then it, it's not must be true. So that's kind of a very, I don't know, unclear way of explaining that. I think the, the theory of the prime factorization is like gonna be the way to go. So what I wanna do here is I'm gonna break this down into 450 and, and Y. And what I need is when I keep breaking it down, at the bottom, I'm gonna need triplets of all my factors, my prime factors. So got a little while to go here. I wanna make sure I don't screw this up. If I screw it up, call me out. 
So what I've got is I've got a three and a three, um, but I don't have another three. I'm missing another three, okay? I've got a, uh, I should have used different shapes. I should have done the three in triangles and the fives in pentagons. Um, I can still salvage the pentagons, okay? The twos are gonna be an issue. Uh, so I have a couple of fives as well, and, and I have a two. So remember, at the bottom of a perfect cube, at the bottom of a perfect cube, I'm gonna need triplets of everything. So I have twins, I have twin threes. So I need another three somewhere, and it's gonna to have to come from Y. Yeah, one, two, three threes, good. I'm good on the threes. Uh, what about the twos? I only have one of those, so it's not even a twin yet. It's only child. So I need another two and another two. And now I've got triplet twos. And finally, you only have a couple of fives in the building blocks of 450Y, so I need to add one more five. And you'll see all of these new additions have to be supplied by Y. And so Y must be composed of at least a two, a two, a three, and a five. And that is going to be uh, Roman numeral one here. Uh, yeah, that must be an integer because Y has to supply these because you can't get the other twos, the five or three from uh, the other part of 450 Y. So yeah, I had uh, some good suggestions here. But that one's tough. So I think one of the things to do when you're practicing recognizing is also to practice recognizing when you don't recognize what to do. Um, because you also need to be aware of that when you're going through the real exam, right? We can't afford to get stubborn and really try thinking through this problem for six minutes. Um, because you could think through it for six minutes and still get it wrong. Might as well just think through it for six seconds or 30 seconds. I'm giving you 30 seconds here um, and, and bail on it. Yeah. Um, cool. Wow, that, that hour went by really, really quickly. Um, I, had, I had some more stuff to do, but I think what I'll end up doing is I'll save it for later. Yeah, I had some stuff to talk to you about um, when it comes to recognizing issues in sentence correction. Uh, and, and some stuff like that. But what I want to do is I want to leave you with uh, a, couple, a couple other things, right? I want to make sure that you can take something from this lesson uh, and something you're actually going to use. So I want you to start practicing this recognition drill, okay? Uh, I want you to get a comprehensive problem source so you don't know that you're just dealing with rate problems or just dealing with divisibility problems. So get like the official guide. Um, that has a breadth of content, a breadth of difficulty and format, all right? Build sets of random questions. You could just do this like, I'm gonna look at question one, 101, 201, 301, and 401, right? That's five questions and give yourself 30 seconds per question, right? Record yourself, right? So you know how you are kind of experiencing those first 30 seconds, right? It's good to kind of listen to yourself go through this um, and see kind of what you were able to pick up and some of the things that you weren't able to pick up that maybe you should. What are gonna be the signs uh, that you, you missed, okay? So you're gonna listen to the recording, you're gonna analyze it, you're gonna figure out what you did well. Um, you might surprise yourself. I always surprise myself when I um, kind of record myself. I'm like, that wasn't perfect, but I actually did some pretty good things in here. Uh, what are the things that you missed? Then you can repeat that, right? Do question two and 102 and 202, et cetera. And something else that would be really useful is this stuff's always better to do um, if you've got kind of a study partner. So come up with the same list of questions, okay? Uh, and give yourself time to do the recognition drill. I'd, rec I'd recommend like marking the pages uh, that the questions are on too, just ahead of time. Uh, but then, yeah, record yourself and then like, Listen to each other's recordings and see, hey, did that person, did my partner recognize things that I didn't? Maybe I could see that next time, right? Kind of bounce ideas, uh, you know, back and forth off of, off of each other. 
Um, so that would be something to do kind of, kind of moving forward. Uh, there's a couple other questions coming in in chat, um, and here is uh, what I'll do. I want to make sure that we're aware of uh, your other free options when it comes to Manhattan GMAT prep. So come to uh, session one live online or in person if you're nearby. And you can also check out our uh, Interact on-demand course, um, the first few lessons of that as well. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, tell the person editing this video that they are welcome to uh, stop the recording here, but I will go back and uh, tackle a few more of these questions. So. If you're watching online, thanks. All right, so let's check this out. Um, Maddie asked, uh, yeah, thanks, I appreciate it, thanks for coming. Maddie asked if you bail on that, that perfect cube question, uh, what would you guess? And I, I, I don't even know, I don't even know how I would guess here. Um, I think you could spend maybe too long thinking about how you would guess. You could spend a minute trying to think how you would guess and then just lose that minute. Um, if you, none of, I mean, answers B, C, and D are symmetrical, and there's also some symmetry between A and E. Uh, I could see the GMAT, and this is an official problem too um, from one of, the, one of the practice exams. I could see the GMAT like trying to trap you with A or with E. Um, not sure, I don't have a good answer there. Um, how can we apply these techniques for verbal? I think it's transferable definitely to sentence correction because sentence correction is really all about kind of recognizing splits, okay? Recognizing splits and content issues, right? Grammatical rules that are being violated, um, issues of meaning, stuff like that. And I think there are uh, some key phrases you can look out for when it comes to uh, modifiers, when it comes to parallelism for sure, um, comparisons, pronouns, right? great, great kind of pronoun markers, even like verb tense issues. So that would be something to look at. Um, you can look for certain issues in sentence structure, right? Like semicolons, what's the rule with semicolons? Uh, M dashes or colons, opening modifiers. Um, if there's like a subject verb gap, right? They present the subject and then go off on a tangent and like the verb comes a lot later. Like that's probably gonna be an opportunity for them to be testing you on subject verb issues. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can do it in sentence correction. In critical reasoning, it's a little tougher. What I would say you wanna do in critical reasoning is start building like this question bank uh, of like bad arguments, right? Cause I think, and I've done a, I've done a video on argument deconstruction in the past, but I would say there's only like a handful of like bad argument templates that come, uh, come around in critical reasoning. And you can usually relate, strengthen, weaken, find the assumption, evaluate the argument questions to this kind of handful of bad argument templates. So that's where I think the recognition drill comes into play in critical reasoning. Unfortunately, it often takes more than 30 seconds, right? You've got to read the argument, you've got to deconstruct it, you've got to kind of take a look at what the potential flaw is. Um, what I don't recommend in critical reasoning is looking at the answer choices for clues, um, because the answer choices are oftentimes very confusing or very tempting if you don't have the argument fully deconstructed. So, um, and then reading comp, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to like read a passage in 30 seconds and be like, oh yeah, this reminds me of that other asteroid passage I read. Probably can't do that. Um, yeah, let's see. There was another one I wanted to see. What's the difference between must be true and could be true? Yeah. Um, oh boy. Yeah, so here's how I would, like, here's how I test must be true versus could be true. Um, when I'm trying to test like in critical reasoning what must be true, all I'm looking for is one, one possibility that shows that that's not, that it doesn't have to be true. Mm, that's like not a great way to, to say that. Um, so why don't I just make an easier version of this problem, okay? Why don't I make an easier version of this problem? Let's make, a, um, we'll make, come up with a number. It's close. Uh, why don't we just do like 32y equals n cubed, right? Which of the following must be true? And I'll do, 
I'll just change some of these. Um, I'll do something like this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I need n cubed. Or excuse me, I need 32y to break down into triplets. All right, so two, 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 triplets. Two, two, missing a triplet. So I need this y to provide me at least another two, okay? So whatever this y has to do, it must have this two because they, it has to go with these other twos here that are just kind of left hanging, right? These twos are grouped, right? So I don't need to worry about them anymore. But I need this one to hang out, all right? So I know y is going to have to, must, supply an extra 2. That doesn't mean, like, y can't also supply, like, a bunch of 3s, right? Because now these are grouped. These are triplets, right? But y doesn't have to supply these 3s. There's nothing here that says, like, I need triplets of numbers other than 2. So, like, it might be that y is divisible by 3, and y is divisible by 3 and 2, right, in these situations. But this doesn't actually have to exist, right? I could also have y, y could be 250 in this case, in which case it's got a bunch of fives. And now you'll see, oh, it doesn't actually have to be divisible by three, but it always needs the two. So like, that's kind of what, what has to happen here, all right? It could be Roman numeral two or three, but it has to be Roman numeral one. Uh, Again, like I don't know if there's a great way to go through that problem um, without the theory because the numbers are just so kind of large. Um, testing cases is too hard on numbers like 450. Uh, yeah, uh, the advanced quant book. Is it worth reading for a person scoring in the 44 to 49 range? Here's what I say about the advanced quant book. Here's actually what it says in the first few pages. It says you should use the advanced quant book if uh, you're scoring kind of like at a 47, right? If you've scored a 47 on an official quant section, or if you scored a 47 on a Manhattan practice exam, I believe it's like, and you're looking to score like 49 or above on quant, then go ahead and start moving through the book. I really like that book. That book is, um, it's, it's challenging, but it's got lots of good lessons and it's got lots of really good problems. And, you know, there are, some of them are very, very tough. Um, but I think, They've got some really good lessons in there. Yes, yeah, some of my favorite problems I do, uh, like in tutoring and stuff, come from that book. Really good. Yeah, good stuff. Um, I think that's going to be it. Yeah, I think that's going to be it. Yes, thank you. I appreciate you guys coming, as always. You guys are awesome.